Today's lecture will cover chapter 17, the respiratory system in the human body in health and disease. This lecture will cover the structural plan of the respiratory system, including the upper and lower respiratory tract, the process of respiration, which includes pulmonary ventilation and uh, internal inspiration, and then we'll also talk about what's happening on a cellular level. When we look at the structure of the respiratory system, it looks like an upside down tree. And the, the trunk would be the trachea and the trachea uh, bifurcate into right and left bronchi. And then those bronchi branch into smaller branches called bronchioles. And at the ends of those, we have the alveoli, which kind of is re represented by the leaves of the tree. And the alveoli, help gases to diffuse either in and out of our bloodstream. So some functions of the respiratory system is definitely to maintain homeostasis. The respiratory system is responsible for making sure that our blood has enough oxygen and that there's not too much CO2. It also filters, warms, and humidifies the air that we breathe, and it also serves as an air purification system. So here we get our first look at the structure of the respiratory system. And if I can get my pen out here, um, it starts at, with the nose and mouth, right? We can take air in from the nose and from the mouth and air comes in and it travels down the pharynx or the throat. There are three parts to the throat. We'll talk about those later. And it enters the trachea, which is this part here. And then it bifurcates. Uh, kind of similar to the aorta, right? As it bifurcates into right and left common iliac arteries, the trachea bifurcates into right and left bronchi. And at this bifurcation, there is a special name. It is called the carina. And at the end of those smallest branches called the bronchioles are the alveoli. And the alveoli look like a, a cluster of grapes. And those little alveoli uh, ducts are kind of representative of like the stems of the grapes. And here in the alveoli is where that gas exchange takes place. And as we're going to learn today in this lecture, it's all about pressures and concentration gradients. And those are things that are familiar to us already. So we'll talk more about those as we go along. The respiratory system is divided into two tracts, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract is composed of the nose, the pharynx or throat, and the larynx, and the lower respiratory tract is composed of the trachea, the bronchial tree, and the lungs. So we're going to talk about each of those in detail. The entire respiratory system is lined with a mucous membrane, similar to our digestive tract, right? And we've talked about tissues before, and we know that mucous membranes have these specialized cells within them called the goblet cells. And those, the job of the goblet cells is to produce mucus. And we produce about 125 milliliters of mucus each day. And this mucus serves a couple reasons. It, it serves to coat the respiratory tract, but there is also something else at play here, a specialized tissue called ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. And the majority of the respiratory tract is covered with that, except for uh, uh, inside the nose, the vocal fo folds of the larynx, and the throat or pharynx, and that's covered with stratified squamous epithelium. Now this ciliated pseudostratified epithelium is really special because it has these tiny little cilia on it and it serves to continuously uh, push uh, contaminants that we uh, get from the air up and back out of the respiratory system. So that's part of that function of air purification, right? So this um, uh, ciliated pseudostratified epithelium 
the process of it helping us to purify the air that we breathe, we refer to it as the ciliary escalator. And that makes sense, right? Because an escalator, we can picture that in our mind, an escalator moving somebody from a lower floor to a higher floor. And that is kind of how the cilia helps to move these contaminants up and out of our respiratory tract. Here's an image of those goblet cells inserted in this ciliated pseudostratified epithelium, uh, which is an image that we have seen before. As discussed previously, air enters the nose or the oral cavity, and here it is warmed and humidified. However, we also lose water during expiration or breathing out at about 17.5 milliliters per hour, which increases to four times that when we're exercising. So inside the nose uh, is divided into two parts by a septum, a right and left uh, cavity, and it is lined with that stratified squamous epithelium and it contains our sense of smell. Now the lining of the nose, not only is it very vascular, it also contains those olfactory nerves, right, that we've talked about before. So uh, some um, situations, some conditions that can occur inside the nose are nasal polyps, Nasal polyps are these little redundant growths uh, that uh, come from the mucosal lining and uh, they're non-cancerous and we can remove those. Chronic inflammation could be a cause of the development of nasal polyps. We also have four sinuses that are in and around this area and those are the frontal, maxillary, sphenoidal, and ethmoidal sinuses and they all drain into the nose. Here's a frontal and side view of those sinuses. So you can see in the uppermost part of the forehead, here are the frontal sinuses. And then we have our sphenoid sinuses right here. And our ethmoids are there as well. And then right above the, um, the mouth and below the orbits of the eyes, we have the maxillary sinuses. We can see them here and over here on the frontal view as well. And then we also have, right, these lacrimal sacs that we talked about when we talked about the senses. And these lacrimal sacs drain our tears and those drain into the nose as well. Another name for the pharynx is the throat, and it is about 12.5 centimeters or five inches in length. It is also lined with that stratified squamous epithelium, and it is composed of three parts. The section of the pharynx that is directly posterior to the nose is the nasopharynx. Directly posterior to the mouth, the opening of the mouth is the oropharynx and located just behind the larynx is the laryngopharynx. Now there's also some other openings into the throat which include the auditory tubes that come from the ears and the eustachian tubes. These are our pressure equalization tubes. So we can get draining into the throat from the eustachian tubes. And we also have tonsils there. Uh, we talked about that before, the lingual tonsils that are located right at the back of the tongue, the palatine tonsils, which we typically refer to as our tonsils, directly at the back of the palate, the soft palate, and then those pharyngeal tonsils also referred to as the adenoids, which are located in the nasopharynx. And these can sometimes become inflamed, and then that's when we might uh, do a tonsillectomy. Here's a look at those um, palatine tonsils again in this upper image, and then you can also see the uvula. So this is at the very back of the oral cavity the soft palate is back there, the uvula extends from that, and then you can see the tonsils on either side, the palatine tonsils. 
The other image is uh, looking down the throat and that little V that you see is the opening of the larynx. So vocal cords are there. And then if you can kind of make out this little horseshoe type structure, that's the hyoid bone. It's the only bone in the body that is a free floating bone that is not juxtaposed to another bone. So the pharynx serves as a passage for air and food, and then food will move down the esophagus and air will move into the trachea. On the previous image, the larynx is located at the most distal end of the pharynx, the laryngopharynx. And this top image, you can see um, this diagram of the arytenoid cartilage, which is important uh, structure to identify when we're doing a tracheostomy. And then the opening of the larynx, which is called the glottis. The vocal cords there so as muscles uh, pull on the vocal cords we get a higher speech and as they relax a lower speech so the larynx is also referred to as the voice box now what keeps food from going down the trachea and being routed into the esophagus well that is the job of the epiglottis the epiglottis is a little flap of tissue that comes down at, like a trash can lid and partially covers the opening or the glottis of the larynx. Now, when something goes awry, uh, that is when we get um, some fluid or some particles into our trachea, and that is what causes us to cough because we're trying to eject whatever that is from the, um, the trachea or the bronchi or the lungs, whatever the case may be. Uh, this area is also has a mucosal lining like we talked about before. Individuals that um, have uh, significant smoking habits or drinking alcohol, they can be at a higher risk for laryngeal cancer. If it is suspected that there is some sort of issue going on with the larynx, we can do a biopsy, and that's the first picture that you see there. This is this little cut biopsy forcep. We can uh, just go in and take a little sample of the tissue and test that. Something else that can occur from overuse, and singers uh, get this, is uh, these little nodes or nodules on their vocal cords that can be... Um, uh, ablated by thermal ablation. And then this last image here we see is intubation, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later on in the lecture. I just wanted to take a minute to discuss tracheostomy in more detail because that is something that we're going to be helping with in the operating room. And one of the jobs of the surgical technologist is to prepare or assemble the tracheostomy tube. So on the far right of this slide are the components of the tracheostomy tube. The lowest component on the slide is called the obturator, and that is what is initially going to be inserted into the actual tube, which is the top component that you see. Something else that we're gonna do is we're gonna test the balloon. So if you see that little round, um, structure that looks like it's attached with a tube. There's actually a cuff that is um, the most distal end of that tracheostomy tube. And we're just gonna put some air in there and, and hold it under some saline for a couple seconds and just make sure that it's patent. Insert the obturator and um, then you can see the on the left, the bottom, this is actually a canine a tracheostomy, but pretty much looks the same. We make a, a small incision, an opening into the trachea, and then the tube gets inserted into there. The obturator gets removed, and that middle portion that you see gets inserted into there, and that's where the ventilation tubing gets attached to. 
It's interesting to note at this point that the respiratory tract or any tract that has a direct opening to the outside of the body is not considered sterile. So these procedures are technically not sterile procedures. However, we still do use sterile technique and um, you know, we use the best technique possible, but they are not considered sterile procedures. So um, some reasons that a surgeon might choose to do a tracheostomy on a patient is that they've been intubated for a long period of time. They've developed fluid in their lungs. This allows for the passage of a tube down into the lungs to remove that fluid. Um, and it also helps to improve ventilation of the lungs. There are a variety of upper respiratory infections, or URIs, and rhinitis is the most common. Rhinitis comes from the Greek word rhinos, which means nose, and it just basically means the inflammation of the lining of the nasal mucosa. And some reasons for this could be infectious rhinitis or the common cold. There's actually more than 200 documented viruses that can cause a common cold. So it's not just the, um, the rhino virus. And um, uh, allergic rhinitis can also be a thing, uh, whether it's allergic to pollens or um, something common here in Arizona because of the, the dirt getting stirred up. Um, we are prone to getting hay fever here, so that can cause rhinitis as well. We are also prone to pharyngitis, which just means a sore throat. So that's an inflammation or infection of the throat. Strep throat um, is a good example of this. It is caused by streptococcus. And um, on this image here, you can kind of see the different symptoms that are associated, signs and symptoms with allergies or cold and flu and where they overlap. Um, so with allergies, the mucus is typically clear. If it isn't clear, then we know we have some sort of infection going on and not just inflammation. On the left side of the slide here, we are looking at uh, inflamed larynx, which is laryngitis, inflammation of the mucus lining of the larynx. Uh, is typically accompanied by swelling and edema. And if this occurs, you can get a hoarseness in your voice or lose your voice altogether. And then the uh, other half of the slide, this is the epiglottis and you can see that it looks large and inflamed and there's some fluid uh, here. So some edema is happening and this is epiglottitis which is, uh, can become a life-threatening condition. It is caused by the Hib, uh, the HIB virus. And um, a long time ago, they developed a vaccine for this virus. So it's really rare to see in our day. So typically, uh, in a normal situation, the septum of the nose is uh, divides the, the two openings into equal right and left. Um, if not, this is called a deviated septum. If it's more to the left or more to the right, which could be congenital, you could be born with it, or it can be acquired. Um, this might be from getting a broken nose, or uh, some sort of infection can cause uh, the deviation. And then the other um, disorder associated with the nose that we commonly hear about is called epistaxis. An epistaxis is simply a bloody nose, and sometimes it can look like the individual is losing a lot of blood. Um, like I said before, the uh, nose is very vascular. However, what may look like a large amount of blood loss typically is only a small amount of blood loss. And if we have an individual that has chronic epistaxis, we can actually cauterize uh, some of the vasculature in there to hopefully help with that. Now let's take a look at the lower respiratory tract. Uh, the lower respiratory tract includes the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the lungs. 
And here we are looking at all of those except for the alveoli and the lungs. The trachea is just distal to the larynx and it is about 11 centimeters in length, so a little bit shorter than the pharynx, and it extends from the larynx into the thoracic cavity. It is lined with that ciliated pseudostratified epithelium, and the trachea will bifurcate into the left and right bronchi, and the right bronchi, as you can see here, is a little bit more vertical, and so there is a tendency if items are going to get down into a bronchi that they're uh, more commonly going to become lodged in that right bronchus as opposed to the left bronchus. Now the trachea is uh, held open by these C-shaped rings of cartilage, and that prevents it from collapsing. There is one ring of cartilage that goes all the way around the trachea, and it is the first ring of cartilage, and that is referred to as the cricoid cartilage. And the job of the trachea is to transport air from the pharynx into the lung. Here in this top image, I just wanted you to see the cricoid cartilage, and that is this cartilage right here, and it actually forms a 360 solid ring of cartilage around the trachea. This is significant for surgical purposes because we perform something called cricoid pressure or Selix maneuver. And if you look at the bottom image, you will see this is like if the patient was laying supine, the trachea runs in front of or anterior to the esophagus. So one thing that we worry about when we're putting a patient to sleep is that fluid will come up from the stomach and be aspirated into the lungs or down the trachea. This can have severe complications for the patient, can actually lead to pneumonia and death. So what we want to do is we want to put find that cricoid cartilage. We're going to use some constant pressure down onto that uh, cricoid cartilage while the surgeon or the anesthesiologist, excuse me, is inserting the endotracheal tube. And you can see how this pinches off the esophagus. And this is going to help prevent that chance of aspiration. Now, if something gets lodged in the trachea, that's going to block the airway and the individual is going to be unable to move air in and out of the lungs. And this can cause death within just a few short minutes. So the um, experts recommend what's called the five and five method. And this is the um, combination of abdominal thrusts and back uh, slaps. Uh, to hopefully um, compress the lungs and push air out of those lungs to remove that blockage, whatever it is. If that blockage cannot be removed and the patient becomes unresponsive, then that would call for a tracheostomy. This slide is showing the process of endotracheal intubation, and when a patient is having general anesthetic, they are going to be intubated. And the way that they are intubated is the anesthesia care provider is going to use something called the laryngoscope. It's that metal device that the hand is holding in that top of, uh, left image there, and uh, they're going to tilt the head backwards. The laryngoscope has a little light on it, and they're going to insert that down to the level of the larynx and give a little bit of um, toe-in or counter-traction, and that's going to allow them to see the glottis, the opening between the vocal cords of the larynx, and that tube is going to get inserted through the vocal cords and into the trachea. And that is what is happening in image two. And then the bottom 
image is um, you can see that it has been inserted and what they will do is inflate that cuff that is at the most distal end of the ET tube so that it will stay in place. And then this is how they're going to breathe for the patient during surgery. As I mentioned before, the trachea branches into right and left bronchi. That is plural, singular, we would say bronchus. The right bronchus being more vertical down uh, on the left side, so we're more apt to get something down that right side than the left. After we have the bifurcation, which that area again, uh, where the bifurcation is, is called the carina. The bronchus branches into smaller and smaller and smaller tubes called secondary bronchi and eventually leading to the bronchioles and attached to these little stems, the little grape stems, the bronchioles are the alveoli. And we're going to talk about the alveoli next. The human body has approximately 300 million alveoli, and this is awesome because the alveoli is where gas exchange takes place. So the capillaries uh, are wrapped around these little clusters of alveoli. And in this left image here, you can see this capillary and the alveoli is right up against it with just a very thin space in between. And um, each of these structures is composed of single cell sheet of epithelium, which makes it easier for that gas exchange to take place. There are two different types of cells in the alveoli. There's type 1 cells and there's type 2 cells. So the type 1 cells are the squamous epithelial cells of the alveoli, and the type 2 cells, similar to goblet cells, are responsible for producing something called surfactant. And this surfactant is responsible for reducing the surface tension or stickiness in the walls of the alveoli. So reducing the resistance or the surface tension makes it easier for these alveoli to inflate uh, like a balloon when we take in a breath. Like I said, the alveoli and the capillaries are composed of a single layer of squamous epithelium. And those capillaries surround the alveoli and the distance between the capillary and the alveoli is approximately one micron. And if you look at this image here, a micron is very, very small. So this first outer circle that you see is a human hair. The next dark circle inside is a pollen, and that tiny little dot is a micron there. So that's kind of the relationship. So uh, really there isn't much space between the, the wall, the outer wall of the alveoli and the outer wall of the capillary. And this is what makes it easier for that gas exchange to take place. Here's another image just to give us an idea of that basic process of gas exchange. So uh, you see this arrow that's uh, showing air flowing in or air flowing out of the alveoli. So as air flows in, pressures are higher inside. That is going to cause oxygen to diffuse into the capillary and carbon dioxide, uh, since there's a, a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the capillary, that is going to cause carbon dioxide to move out of the capillary and into the alveoli so that it can be uh, expired into the air. If the alveoli, uh, if those type 2 cells in the alveoli are not producing an adequate amount of surfactant, then we are going to get respiratory distress. There are two different types, infant respiratory distress 
is classified as the leading cause of death in premature infants. This is because surfactant is not fully developed until shortly before birth. So if we have a premature birth, we're going to have a baby that is not going to be able to inflate their lungs very easily. And approximately 5,000 premature babies each year die from this. And it also affects about 50,000 babies annually. So because they don't have enough surfactant, it's going to be really difficult for them to breathe. So what do we do? Um, we actually can put them on a ventilator and we can put a tube down into their lungs that will deliver some of that important surfactant that they are missing. In adults, however, this is acquired. So adult respiratory distress syn syndrome is an impairment of surfactant for a variety of reasons. That could be because um, they've inhaled foreign substances like cigarette smoke or various other underlying conditions can be associated with that as well. Um, inhalation of water or vomit and that the inhalation of vomit goes back to when we are intubating our patient, we are worried about aspiration of contents from the stomach uh, or other chemical fumes can also result in adult respiratory distress syndrome as well. So how do we treat this? We treat this with giving them more oxygen Okay, so supplemental oxygen. In some more extreme cases, the individual may require intubation and to be placed on a mechanical ventilator. And then of course, um, if there's underlying conditions, we're gonna wanna identify and treat those as well. All right, let's look at the structure of the lungs. So we have two lungs and they fill up most of the thoracic cavity. Now, first, let me draw your attention to the left lung. And can you see in this image, the left lung uh, has that cardiac notch. Remember a couple lessons ago when we talked about the heart and how the heart is uh, two thirds of the heart is to the left of the midline. And you can see how this left lung accommodates that um, the heart as it lies more in the left of the thoracic cavity than the right. Now the right lung has three lobes and the left lung only has two lobes. Now when we talked about the heart, we said the apex rests on the diaphragm. Well, now we have the opposite with the lungs. The apex of the lungs is actually the top of the lungs up near the trachea and the base of the lungs are going to be what's resting on the diaphragm. Uh, and we'll learn that when we talk about expiration and inspiration, that the um, movement of the diaphragm is part of what allows us to take a breath in and push a breath out. Just as the pericardium has a uh, a visceral pericardium and a parietal pericardium, so does the lungs. We refer to that as the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. The visceral pleura is going to be like the skin of the apple, and the parietal pleura is going to be more adhered to the thoracic wall, and there is a little space in between, and just enough fluid is produced to make sure that there isn't friction between the two, right? So um, the pleura is this moist, smooth, slippery membrane, and there's the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. Interestingly, the elephant um, respiratory tract has a strong connective tissue in the pleural cavity, and this allows it to withstand the changes of pressures, whether it's snorkeling under the water or out of the water breathing air. 
if the pleura becomes inflamed, then we have something called pleurisy. Pleurisy is the inflammation of the parietal pleura, and it is often characterized by difficulty in breathing and also pain in the thoracic cavity. Um, <clears throat> pleurisy can also be caused by tumors or various infections like tuberculosis and pneumonia. Now, something else that can happen to the lung is that it can collapse. And the medical term for a collapsed lung is called atelectasis. And you can see that represented in the top right image. Um, and this can be caused by um, a pneumothorax where we have an opening to the outside world uh, in the thoracic cavity. And so we have air that is pushing in on the lung. So pneumothorax literally means air in the thorax or we can have a pneumothorax, which is blood in that pleural space. Um, typically, when something like this happens, we are going to put in a chest tube, and the bottom right image is a chest tube, and you can see that it's connected to some sort of device that's sitting down near the floor on that IV pole, and that is called a pleurovac, and a pleurovac is the drainage system that we use with a chest tube. It's kind of the mobile drainage system. And uh, as a surgical tech in surgery, we will be um, dealing with those, handling those, getting those ready. Uh, and another important concept with this pleurovac system is that we make sure that it um, stays lower than the patient so that the drainage system works properly. A couple other situations that can occur with the lungs is pneumonia. Pneumonia is uh, caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria, and uh, it's often characterized by fever, chills, headache, cough, chest pain, um, those types of things. Um, something else that can occur in the lungs is bronchitis. Bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchi, typically due to some sort of infectious particle, but it can also be, uh, it can be chronic or it can be acute. And then lastly, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it is a droplet precaution, so it can be transferred when somebody coughs or sneezes, it can go into the air. Um, so we use isolation precautions with tuberculosis. When we translate tuberculosis, literally, it means condition of having tubercles. And what this means is, uh, uh, refers to as how the, the body reacts to the invasion of these mycobacterium. And what the body does is it, it um, forms these little protective capsules around the bacteria. And those can be visualized on an x-ray. Um, how do we treat this? Um, the majority of these, whether it's bronchitis, pneumonia, or tuberculosis, we are going to treat with various types of antibiotics. And we're also going to um, provide supportive therapy um, by giving the patient more oxygen. Now, acute respiratory distress occurs when we get something stuck in our trachea, right? But if we have something called um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, or COPD, you may have heard it called, emphysema is um, an example of this, as well as chronic bronchitis. So when we have something like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the patient is going to have problems inhaling and exhaling, as opposed to situations um, like restrictive pulmonary disorders. With restrictive pulmonary disorders, um, like cystic fibrosis, the patient is going to have the most trouble with breathing air in, okay? And cystic fibrosis, like I said, is an example of rest a restrictive pulmonary disorder. And remember, we talked about cystic fibrosis previously, and this is due to a genetic mutation or an inherited trait where the chloride ion pumps that are um, 
embedded within the plasma membrane do not function properly and they're pumping out too much chloride ion. Well, when that happens, uh, because it is a, a negative ion and it is a close partner with sodium, which is a positive ion, sodium is going to follow chloride out of the cell. And when sodium and chloride combine, or um, we have high levels of sodium outside of the cell, remember water follows salt. So water is going to leave the cells as well, and this is gonna leave this really thick, sticky mucus that makes it difficult to breathe. In the instance of lung cancer, surgery is the best option for treatment there. And uh, there's a couple different ways we will treat this. One, it can be treated with a lobectomy, and a lobectomy is the removal of a lobe of the lung. Or we could also do a pneumonectomy, which is the removal of the entire lung. Now we're going to talk about pulmonary ventilation. And when we talk about pulmonary ventilation, um, we're talking about inhalation and exhalation. So this is the um, external process of respiration where we're breathing air in and we're breathing air out. Okay, In inspiration, air is going to move into the lungs and expiration, air is going to move out of the lungs. All right, And if our lungs remain compliant and able to stretch, then this is um, how the lungs will expand and contract to move that air. Um, well, the muscles will, of the thoracic cavity will expand and contract to allow the, the lungs to inflate and deflate during external respiration. Now, internal respiration um, is the um, process of gases moving in or out of the alveoli and in or out of the capillaries. So this is the gas exchange between the blood and the cell. So when we take a breath in, our muscles uh, move our ribs out and move our diaphragm down. Right? And this is going to decrease pressure in the lungs. And we know that um, substances move from high pressure to low pressure. So that's going to allow air to move into the lungs. So the diaphragm is going to flatten and it's going to increase top to bottom length of the thorax. And those muscles in between our ribs are going to expand um, and increase the size of the thorax anterior, posteriorly, and laterally. So when we breathe out or when expiration occurs, the reverse is going to happen. The diaphragm is going to flex up and the thoracic cavity is going to um, return to its normal size and shape. And this is going to decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity and increase the pressure inside the thoracic cavity, which is going to cause air to move again down the pressure gradient from highest pressure, which is now in the lungs when we're breathing out, to lower pressure, which is outside. And so air is going to leave the lungs. And as I mentioned, the muscles, the same muscles are involved in inspiration as expiration, but during expiration, the muscles between the ribs are going to contract and depress the rib cage, and it's going to go back to its normal size. The abdominal muscles are going to contract to elevate the diaphragm, and all of this is going to decrease the size of the thoracic cavity and as we said before, increase the pressure, which is gonna cause air to be pushed out of the lungs. So let's talk a little bit about pulmonary volumes or volumes of air exchanged in pulmonary ventilation. 
Volumes of air that are exchanged in breathing are measured with a device called a spirometer. So what is the spirometer going to tell us? Well, the first thing it can tell us is the amount that an individual is just normally breathing in and breathing out with each breath, just normal respirations. It can also tell us the vital capacity. So the vital capacity would be if I asked you to take the biggest breath that you possibly could and then exhale all of that air that you possibly could. So that exhalation of air, that is the vital capacity. So that's the largest amount of air that you can breathe out in one expiration after taking the biggest breath possible, okay? Then we have the expiratory and inspiratory reserve volumes. So the expiratory reserved volume is after you have let out that regular breath, how much more breath can you push out? Okay, so the amount of air that can be forcibly ex exhaled after expiring the tidal volume, which is that normal in and out breath. Now, the inspiratory reserve volume is the opposite of the expiratory reserve volume. So like I mentioned, the inspiratory reserve volume, that's the amount of air that you can forcibly breathe in or inhale after you've breathed in normally. And lastly, the residual volume is simply the air that remains in the lungs after our most forceful expiration. So even after we've pushed out all the air we can possibly push out, there's still gonna be a little bit left in there and that's what we call the residual volume. So as I mentioned, one of the functions of the respiratory system is to maintain homeostasis. And one of the ways that it does that is by the regulation of the ventilations, all right? So this is going to balance the demand for oxygen and the um, removal of carbon dioxide. Now the brainstem is responsible for controlling our respirations and there are two main areas um, of the medulla oblongata that are responsible for breathing rhythm and these are called the ventral respiratory group and the dorsal respiratory group. Now it is believed that the ventral respiratory group is responsible for the basic rhythm of our breathing, right? About 12 to 18 respirations per minute. And the dorsal respiratory group is responsible for adjusting that rhythm. So let's say you go out and run a mile and now you're breathing harder and faster. That is thanks to this dorsal respiratory group that is going to continue to help balance the demands for oxygen and the, um, the removal of that carbon dioxide. Because as we exercise, we're using more oxygen, there's waste products from cellular respiration, and we have to blow that off as carbon dioxide. And we talked about that as being a negative feedback loop. So the brainstem is taking in all of this information from other parts of the body to help us regulate our breathing rhythm, right, to maintain this homeostasis. And there are specific areas in the ponds called the pontine centers, and these centers are believed to communicate with areas in the medulla that regulate and adjust breathing as needed. So while breathing is pretty much a automatic process that is regulated by our brain stem, we're not locked into that automatic process, right? I can't tell my heart to speed up beating or to slow down per se, but if you tell me to take a deep breath, I can take a deep breath, right? And so that is our voluntary control of our respirations. And that is controlled by the cerebral cortex, and then there are some other receptors, right, that influence respiration. Like I said before, the brainstem is receiving all of this feedback from other receptors and sensors in our body. So one of those are the chemoreceptors. 
chemoreceptors that are located in our carotid arteries and in our aorta are continuously sensing the changes in the pH, right? If oxygen, uh, what oxygen levels are and what carbon dioxide levels are. So they're going to give feedback to the brainstem. That's going to cause it to um, regulate those respirations appropriately. And another uh, receptor is the stress receptors. And there's stress receptors located in our lungs and they respond to the stretch in the lungs and they help us to avoid overinflation of the lungs and damage due to overinflation. Some quick review of medical terminology here. Remember, eupnea is normal breathing, where hyperventilation is rapid, deep respirations. Hypoventilation is going to be slower than normal respiration, slower than 12 to 18 respirations per minute. And dyspnea is going to be difficult breathing or labored breathing. And lastly, um, orthopnea is uh, difficulty breathing that is relieved by moving into an upright or sitting position. So if we have an individual that's having a difficult time breathing while they're laying down and that is resolved by up, sitting upright uh, or moving into an upright position, um, then we refer to that as orthopnea. Continuing on with our med term review, apnea refers to as stopped respirations. And if we have a continued um, apneic episode, then that can lead to what we refer to as respiratory arrest. Cheyenne Stokes is characterized by episodes of no breathing and then episodes of hyperventilation. And this can be associated with certain critical conditions such as congestive heart failure, brain injuries, or brain tumors in those sensory areas of the brain. And then lastly, like I mentioned, respiratory arrest is the failure to resume breathing after a period of apnea. Okay, so we're coming into the home stretch here, and our last objective is to talk about gas exchange and transport. So let's start with um, blood is picking up oxygen in the lungs. Okay, so blood um, picks up oxygen in the lungs and this is our external respiration, right? So because of these different pressure gradients, again, this is why this is happening. When we take a breath in, there is a higher concentration of oxygen in the alveoli. And we know that um, diffusion is the concept of molecules moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So this means that oxygen is a higher concentration in the alveoli. It is going to diffuse into the capillaries, okay? Now, a small portion of oxygen is going to remain dissolved in the plasma. So as soon as it gets into the capillary, it dissolves uh, diffuses into the plasma, but that's not a very efficient way to transport oxygen. So just a minute amount, about one and a half percent, is going to remain dissolved in the plasma. The rest is going to um, attach to the hemoglobin to become oxyhemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin is like an oxygen sponge. And so those um, irons, right, that are located in each of those protein strands of the hemoglobin are going to attract oxygen to it. Okay, so oxyhemoglobin is made, all right? And so this is gonna travel through the bloodstream and um, it is going to um, reach 
a point, a jumping off point into the tissues in those capillary beds, right? And now we have that capillary exchange going on, right? More hydrostatic pressure is going to push those gases or that oxygen, in this case, we're specifically talking about that, into the tissues, okay? So that's what's happening there. It's a, um, important to note that um, you know, the air that we breathe out is not 0% oxygen. It still has about 75% saturated oxygen when we breathe out. In summary, oxygen can travel around the body in two forms. One, it can remain dissolved in the plasma, but that's a very small percent. And two, it travels as oxyhemoglobin, because it attaches to the hemoglobin, and this is a more efficient way to transport that oxygen from place to place. Now, let's talk about carbon dioxide. Here we are, we are at the um, venous side of the capillary. We've just dropped off our oxygen, and our cells have been working really hard, and they're putting off a waste product called carbon dioxide because of cellular respiration. So we're going to have carbon dioxide infusing into the capillary. So what happens then? Well, a small amount of it, about 10%, is going to be carried in the dissolved form. But again, this isn't very uh, efficient process. So about 20% of it is going to bind to the hemoglobin, and it's going to form something called carbaminohemoglobin. All right, so 20% is doing that, 10% is floating around in the blood, but what about that other 70%? That other 70% that is dissolved in the plasma is going to become something called carbonic acid. So this happens because CO2 has uh, dissolved into the water or the blood plasma, if you will, and some of those CO2 molecules are going to hook up or associate with water, okay? And that's gonna make carbonic acid. That is H2CO3. Now we have this situation where now one of the hydrogens isn't being held as tightly to the, um, to the molecule. So we're gonna have one of those hydrogens is going to break away. So we're gonna have these free hydrogen ions floating in the water. And what do we know about an increase in hydrogen ions? That is an increase in, in um, acidity, right? So as hydrogen ions go up, so does the acidity in our blood, right? So that, that's the process that's happening here on a cellular level. And the way that we are going to decrease that um, uh, acidity is by getting it to getting that product back to the alveoli, and then a reverse reaction is going to happen. So what's going to happen is now those bicarbonate ions. Um, that are formed because of the dissociation of that one hydrogen ion are going to um, reach the alveoli and then a reverse reaction is going to happen so that CO2 um, can move from that higher concentration, right, that is in our venous system into the alveoli and then it can be expirated and that is going to maintain that homeostasis in our blood. Hopefully this was helpful and this makes sense. This concludes our lecture on the respiratory system. I hope that you found it helpful. I look forward to discussing this with you in more detail when we have class. Thanks for listening.